In our last episode, we finally confronted Kellogg and ended him. But we learned some awful news about Sean. Kellogg had him, but gave him back to the Institute. And somehow, Sean is no longer a baby. Kellogg said that Sean was a bit older than we had expected. Nick Valentine said that Kellogg came to Diamond City with what looked like a 10-year-old boy. Somehow, between Nora being murdered and Nate stepping out of his cryopod, Sean aged 10 years. But Kellogg was our last lead. We have no idea where to turn. If we had Nick Valentine with us at Fort Hagen, we had a brief conversation, and then he tells us that we should talk with Piper. Maybe her journalistic instinct can help us out here. However, if we didn't have Nick Valentine with us at Fort Hagen, we need to head back to the Valentine Detective Agency to let Nick know what happened. So we'll start by finding out what happens when we talk with Nick. And upon arrival, we find Piper waiting for us. Come on, Nicky. I'm just asking for your opinion. Would be a great quote. He's my client, Piper. Why don't you learn not to snoop on a man's private affairs? Well, well, speak of the devil. You're back. And not with your son. What happened? Where do you want me to start? The part where Kellogg turned out to be working for the Institute? Or the part where he told me they have Sean? I... I didn't make it in time. Kellogg was working with the Institute, and he... He gave them Sean. This is your fault, Nick. You had me running all over the place while Kellogg was busy handing Sean over to the Institute. You were right, Nick. Kellogg did have my son. But that wasn't all. He was working with the Institute. He... He gave them Sean. The Institute? Oh, boy. I'm sorry, friend. Truly. That makes things considerably more complicated. He ain't kidding. Heck, Nick's a synth, and even he doesn't know how to get in. No synth does. Security protocols strip those memories out. You don't know anything, Nick? I woke up in a junk pile ages ago. Just another discarded prototype. The Institute hasn't come calling since. I'm sorry. No, oh, Mr. Metal for Hands doesn't know how to get back to the factory. No, I skipped that part of the orientation film while they were busy pulling me apart and putting me back together again. Look, the sad thing is... I have no idea. Bullshit. You're a synth, Valentine. Tell me what you know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down, Blue. It's all right. The man's clearly upset. Look, Piper's right. Sad thing is, I have no idea. I need to find a way. And we have a similar conversation to the one we had at Fort Hagen. But if instead, we head to public occurrences to talk with Piper... Well, well. Nikki Valentine walks into my office for a change. What can I say, Piper? You, me, and hard luck all seem to run together like acid rain down an old sewer. You, uh, including your client here in that analogy? So, you two are finally letting me in on this little case of yours. What's the story? Kellogg kidnapped my son, handed him over to the Institute. I'm going to find them and make them regret what they've done to me. We need help, Piper. This man named Kellogg kidnapped my son. But that wasn't all. He was working with the Institute. He... He gave them Sean. The Institute. Oh, boy. And from here on out, the two different versions of this conversation converge. I've been investigating these creeps for over a year now. <laughs> the Commonwealth's boogeyman. Feared and hated by everyone. True enough. Sometimes they snatch people in the middle of the night... And sometimes they leave old synths behind to remind us that they're out there. But to this day, there's one thing nobody really knows. Where the Institute actually is. Or how to get in. Exactly. But there's one person who has to know, right? The guy who just handed them Sean. Kellogg. Huh. What about him? He had to have a way in and out. But... Well, we both know that angle is cut off. Or if Nick wasn't with us when we killed Kellogg. He had to have a way in and out. But am I right in thinking he's not available for a chinwag? You read my mind. 
He had to have a way in and out. Yeah, but we both know he's not exactly available for a chat and coffee. Or if Nick didn't know. Yeah, but something tells me he's not gonna drop by for a chat and coffee. Whatever you're thinking, it doesn't matter. He's dead. Yeah, I knew he wasn't gonna go quietly the moment I saw him. Or if Nick wasn't there. Yeah, figures the Institute's only man on the outside wouldn't be the type to be taken alive. Man like that would have had access, in and out. But we both know that angle isn't going to work. And again, if he didn't know. Yeah, but I'm guessing he wasn't the surrender and talk type, was he? Yeah. Any other ideas, Nick? Talk about a literal dead end, huh? But if he didn't know Kellogg was dead? That's what I thought. He's dead. We can talk to him. Feel like holding a seance? Yeah, if only. And if he didn't know? <laughs> a literal dead end, huh? Bastards in hell. Where he belongs. He's dead, Nick. So, a murderer and a kidnapper gets his brains blown out by an avenging parent. Huh. <sighs> Be a great ending if we didn't still have the biggest mystery in the Commonwealth to solve. So, what now? I was so blinded by anger. I just wanted him dead. Now look what I've done. He wasn't gonna talk. Even if I had a way of bringing him in alive. Doesn't matter what he knew. I'd kill him again in a heartbeat. Gets his brains blown out. Huh. His brains. You know, we may not need the man at all. You're talking crazy here, Nick. Got a fault in the old subroutines? Look, there's a place in Good Neighbor called the Memory Den. Relive the past moments in your mind as clear as the day they happened. If anyone could get a dead brain to sing, it'll be Dr. Amari. The mind behind the memories. Who's this Dr. Romari? I'll let her give you her life story in person. Let's stay focused. <laughs> I don't know, Nick. That seems a little... out there. You're talking to a synth. I am a little out there. Just stay with me on this. There's no way that could ever work. <clears throat> stay with me on this. I hope you're right, Nick. Let's see. I guess we're gonna need a piece of Kellogg's brain. Enough gray matter to bring to Amari and find out if this is going to work. Jesus, Nick. Gross. Seriously? I know it's grisly, but what choice do we have? We got no leads. Nothing. That old Merc's brain just might have all the secrets we need to know. What exactly do we need, Nick? Kellogg's brain. It's a long shot, but Dr. Amari just might be able to get it jump-started. See what the old Merc knew. I'm gonna need a really sharp ice cream scoop. I'm sure you'll manage. It's a dead end, Nick. Face it, we lost. Sean's gone. He's not gone. It's a long shot, but it's the only one we got. But then we remember, we don't need Kellogg's brain at all. Not his organic brain, anyway. After killing him, we found three interesting things on his body. Nate even noticed it at the time. All this tech. You were barely human. We found a limb actuator. This doesn't help us. It just made Kellogg hit harder. We found a pain inhibitor. This doesn't help us. It just made it so Kellogg couldn't feel pain. And we found a brain augmenter. This might actually help us. Maybe this is all we need to bring to Dr. Amari in the memory den. Which is why Nate can say... Actually, I think I already have something. Kellogg had this thing attached to his head. Cybernetics, huh? We may have just won the lottery. Whether we're riding this crazy brain train or not, we can't all go running across the Commonwealth, so... Who's coming with you? I have to go to the memory den either way, if I'm gonna introduce you to Omari. But if you want to head there together, just say so. Anything else you can tell me about the memory den? It's in Good Neighbor, a little slice of trouble northeast of ways. The memory den ain't just a fancy name, it's literal. A lot of people give up all their caps just to relive the good parts of their lives. Over and over. But not us. We're gonna try to dive deep into someone else's mind. I can meet you there or we can head out together. I'll head out with Piper. We'll meet you there, Nick. Sounds good. You two stay out of trouble. It's you and me, Nick. Let's get going. I already have someone with me. I'll meet you there, Nick. All right. See you at the den. Don't worry. We're gonna get your boy back. Just a few more steps. Uh, well, you two are out. I'm gonna do some more research. I'll be at the public if you need me. 
Piper doesn't have any unique conversation for the remainder of this quest, but Nick does, so we'll take him. At last, we get to go to this good neighbor we've heard so much about. It's not too far from the entrance to Vault 114. Starting from there, we travel north past the old granary burial grounds. Continuing down the road, we pass a ruined on-ramp to the right and two green skyscrapers swarming with super mutants. At last, the road opens up into an intersection and turning right, we arrive outside the gate to Good Neighbor. Good Neighbor appears to be a neighborhood of Boston that's been boarded up and walled up to create a secluded city. Heading through the front door, we see a bald man waiting for us on the other side. If we don't have Nick with us... Hey, hold up there. First time in Good Neighbor? You can't go walking around without insurance. But if we do have Nick with us... Well, well, well. It's the detective. Tracking down another wayward husband to his mistress? Why? Someone stand you up? You trying that, uh, what do you call it? Evasive language on me? And who are you, huh? Valentine's new dick in training? We're hiring, but, uh, I don't think you'd measure up. Don't be like that. You just got the look of someone who's in the market for a little insurance. What's it to you? Gotta know who's backing who and good neighbor. I ain't never seen you before. Maybe you're in the market for a little insurance? Not your concern. Oh, it's not, huh? Well, with that attitude, you're gonna be in the market for a little insurance. We're working together, yeah. Really? Well, you're in luck. I got a special offer on some insurance for partners of the great gumshoe here. Unless it's keep dumb assholes away from me insurance. I'm not interested. Now, don't be like that. I think you're gonna like what I have on offer. Insurance? That's right. Insurance. Personal protection, like. You better back off. Well, you're the one who's gonna need insurance. What was that? I, I couldn't hear over the sound of all that pathetic. But if we pass the charisma check... Whoa, whoa, hey, all right. We'll just say your insurance is paid up for now, okay? Insurance? I'm listening. That's right. Insurance. Personal protection, like. You hand over everything you got in their pockets, or accidents start happening to you. Big, bloody... Accident. Whoa, 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 time out. Nick Valentine makes a rare visit to town, and you're hassling his friend here with that extortion crap? Good to see you again, Nick. Hancock? This Hancock character says something slightly different if Nick isn't in our party. Someone steps through the gate the first time, they're a guest. You lay off that extortion crap. What do you care? He ain't one of us. No love for your mayor, Finn? I said, let him go. You soft, Hancock. You keep letting outsiders walk all over us. One day, there'll be a new man. Come on, man. This is me we're talking about. Let me tell you something. Why'd you have to go and say that, huh? Breaking my heart over here. You all right, brother? I'm fine. Thanks for taking care of him. Good. Now don't let this incident taint your view of our little community. It's not every day I get mugged and then witness a murder right in front of me. You obviously haven't been living it up enough, but we won't judge you for that. You killed him! Got a good pair of eyes on you. I think you'll fit in here. Your face... something... happened? Like it? I think it gives me a sexy, King of the Zombies kind of look. Big hit with the ladies. I'm a ghoul, you see? A lot of walking rad freaks like me around here, so you might want to keep those kinds of questions on the low burner next time. Good neighbors of the people, for the people. You feel me? Everyone's welcome. Good neighbor? That what you call this place? That's right. We cobbled this little neighborhood together out of the freaks and misfits that just wouldn't be accepted anywhere else. You'll see. You make enough friends here, you'll call this place home soon enough. Of the people, for the people? <laughs> Brother. <laughs> I can tell I'm gonna like you already. Just consider this town your home away from home. Sounds like anarchy. The best kind of anarchy. Embrace it, and maybe one day you'll call this little slice of chaos home. Yeah, I feel you. Good. You stay cool, and you'll be part of the neighborhood. So long as you remember who's in charge. With that, we meet our first non-feral ghoul. We learned from Piper that Mayor McDonough of Diamond City kicked all the ghouls out of Diamond City, and it looks like this is where they all came. Hancock here is escorted by a personal enforcer named Fahrenheit. A new player in Good Neighbor. Hello, little pawn. 
Welcome to our fun and games. Oh, and she seems playful. Finn here has one bottle cap on his inventory and just a little bit of ammunition. There are a number of shops right out here by the entrance, and it seems like even the people of Good Neighbor are already aware of the Brotherhood's arrival. Uh, whoever this Brotherhood of Steel is, I'm not buying that we come in peace malarkey. Vault suit, huh? Hell yeah. We see another interesting bald guy here, though this one's not interested in extortion. Hey, what's up? What a day, huh? Everyone's welcome and good neighbor. Even me. Don't you have, like, important things to do? Nothing more to say. Something familiar about this guy? Could have sworn I saw him earlier. At any rate, moving down the alleyway, we turn left, past a pub called The Third Rail, where we hear more gossip about the Brotherhood. Brotherhood of Steel better stay out of good neighbor. That's all I'm saying. And crossing a street, we arrive at Scully Square. I did a video all about Good Neighbor and the real world history of Scully Square that you can watch here. But for now, we see that this building is now called the Memory Den, and we can head inside. On the other side of the door, we pass down a dimly lit hallway to enter a large room where we overhear a conversation. Well, well, Mr. Valentine. I thought you had forgotten about little old me. May have walked out of the den, Irma, but I'd never walk out on you. Hmm. Amari's downstairs, you big flirt. With that, Nick heads downstairs, and we can try to talk with this Irma character. Here for Amari? She's downstairs. Hey, Irma. Whatever you and Nick are up to, I don't need to know. Just don't let the big metal softy hurt himself. All right? Don't let Nick spend too much time with Amari down in that lab of hers. I'll start to get jealous. But she's not up for talking right now. And so heading down the stairs, we follow Nick Valentine into a large, brightly lit room where we find a scientist at a console. Dr. Amari? Yes? I take it this isn't a social call. Doctor, it's time for you to reverse death itself. What? Uh, I wouldn't have put it quite that way, but it's true. You're the one who can extract memories from a brain, right? Normally, we only allow our clients to experience their own memories. Now, what's this all about? We need your help, Doctor. I need the memories from a man named Kellogg. But he's dead. I know it's asking for a miracle, Omari. But you've pulled off the impossible before. This one's all yours, Nick. We need a memory dig, Omari. But it's not going to be easy. The perp. Kellogg is already cold on the floor. Are you too mad? Putting aside the fact that you're asking me to defile a corpse, you don't realize that the memory simulators require intact, living brains to function. I mean, technically, the corpse was defiled already. Isn't there some way to make this work? Some expert you are. I knew this was a waste of time. Please. Nick told me you're the only one who can make this work. This dead brain had inside knowledge of the Institute, Amari. The biggest scientific secret of the Commonwealth. You need this, and so do we. Fine. I'll take a look. But no guarantees. Do you have it with you? How much of the brain do you need exactly? That is not an encouraging question. I suppose I'll have to make do with whatever you can find. Could you say that like Dr. Frankenstein? Ego, fetch me the brain. No? No, I will not. Now, do you have it? I'm not ready to do this yet. Well, you better be soon. I doubt that brain is being properly preserved. Time is against us. Here's what I could find. What's this? This isn't a brain. This is... Wait, that's the hippocampus. And this thing attached to it? A neural interface? Ah, those circuits look awfully familiar. I'm not surprised. From what I've seen, all Institute technology has a similar architecture. So the brain is still good, right? Possibly. There's no sign of decay, so the tech is probably preserving the tissue, injecting some kind of compound to keep it stable. But there's no way to access the memories inside without a compatible port. You're talking about me, right? I'm an old synth. If the Institute built me out of similar parts, we might have an in. There could be long-term side effects. I don't know where to even begin with listing the risks. Don't bother. I don't need to hear them. 
Plug me in, Doc. Nick's an older model synth. Is he compatible? That's exactly what I was thinking. If we are lucky, it should hook right in. But even if this works, Mr. Valentine would be taking on a tremendous amount of risk. We're talking about wiring something to his brain. Don't worry about me, Amari. Let's do it. Skip to the good part, Doc. We plug the brain implant into Mr. Valentine, assuming he's willing to take on the risks. Hell, why not? Plenty of room in my head anyway. Go on, Doctor. Mr. Valentine is an older generation synth. But Institute technology being what it is, the brain implant could fit him. But that's an incredible risk to take. We're talking about wiring something to his brain. Don't worry about me, Amari. I'm well past the warranty date anyway. You really think this'll work, Nick? No idea. But we got a missing kid on the line. That's worth the risk. We should try plugging you into a toaster next. Mmm, fresh toast. Uh, it's nice to know that even when I'm about to have a foreign object shoved into my noggin, you find new horrible ways to laugh at my expense. Just don't damage that brain, you two. I need it. Trust me, Amari's hands are the safest place a brain can be. I appreciate this, Nick. You can thank me when we've found your son. All right, let's do this. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Valentine. Just sit down. If I start cackling like an old grizzled mercenary, pull me out, okay? Let's see here. I need you to keep talking to me, Mr. Valentine. Any slight change in your cognitive functions could be dire. Are you feeling any different? There's a lot of flashes. Static. I, I, I can't make sense of any of it, Doc. That's what I was afraid of. The mnemonic impressions are encoded. It appears the Institute has one last failsafe. There's a lock on the memories in the implant. How do you lock memories? The implant is encoding all the mnemonic activity in the hippocampus. Think of it like computer encryption. And we don't have the password. Is Nick gonna be okay? Yes, the connections appear to be stable. Hopefully, it'll be as simple as unplugging the implant once we're done. More problems. Seriously? It's not like anyone has ever done this before. You try making a secret technology work across hardware generations out of spare parts. Tell me you have a way past this, Doc. Let me think. The encryption is too strong for a single mind. But what if we use two? We load both you and Mr. Valentine into the memory loungers. Run your cognitive functions in parallel. He'll act as a host while your consciousness drives through whatever memories we can find. Any idea what I'm gonna see in there? I have no clue. But considering we only have a single piece of the medial temporal lobe and not the whole brain, I doubt it'll be cohesive. Nick and I are gonna share a mind? Yeah, I'm not gonna see him in any compromising positions, am I? Yeah, if a smart mouth was all it took to solve problems, we would have found your son by now. Um, no. You won't have to worry about that. The only memories you'll access are the ones in the implant. I'm not ready for this, Doc. Okay, but I need to keep Mr. Valentine here until you're ready. I don't want him moving around with that implant still attached. Nick, I can feel that implant jostling around back there. You and Amari better figure this out. I don't want to have this implant stuck there forever. All right, let's get started. Just sit down over there and... Keep your fingers crossed. See you on the other side. With that, Nick gets up and climbs into the memory lounger, a device that might look familiar if the lone wanderer was here. Heading to the lounger that Amari pointed to, we can climb inside ourselves. A television slides in front of our face, and Codsworth looks a little worried for us. Initiating brainwave migration between the transplant and the host. Mnemonic activity coming from the transplant. It's degenerated, but it's there. We're going to load you into the strongest memories we can find. They might not be stable. Just hold on. Can you hear me? Ah, good. The simulation appears to be working, 
although the memories are quite fragmentary. I'll try to step you through the intact memories and hope we find one that gives us some clue to the Institute's location. There. This is the earliest intact memory I can find. We see some sort of brain connections form before us, and we can traverse them with our consciousness. At the end of the path, we arrive in a room, and a scene plays out before us. Remember, you are experiencing these memories as Kellogg. This may prove disorienting at first. That makes it official, folks. The final vote count- Turn down the goddamn radio! I'm trying to sleep! California Republic. All five states have now signed on, which means that as of this moment, we are all citizens of the new California Republic. I'm sure that's going to take some getting used to for a lot of people. Mm, what a joke. What's it mean, Mom? Nothing, Connie. People like to talk and hope someone else is going to keep them safe. Teacher at school said the NCR would bring back the good old days, like before the big war. Don't you listen to that twaddle. I'm going to stop singing you if that's what they're teaching you. I'm going out. Where the fuck did you put my boots? Listen to me, Connie. You take this. You're old enough. You're the man of the family now. It's your job to protect us. Your father's useless. But you won't turn out like him. You're a good boy. And all that on the radio. All useless talk. The only thing that will protect you in this world is that gun in your hands. You need to learn to use it if you're going to survive. I... I will, Mom. I promise. I won't let you down. We have always been my good boy. This doesn't seem to be what we're looking for. There appears to be another intact memory close to you in temporal sequence. There. Try that one. The scene ends, but we can still interact with it. In addition to watching the memory, we can learn Kellogg's thoughts about individual parts of the memory by interacting with them. So for the remainder of this sequence, we'll first watch the memory and then learn what Kellogg has to say about it. Mom knew how it was. She wasn't soft, but uh, she loved me in, in her way. And she protected me from Dad. <laughs> that cost her more than a few beatings. I never knew what happened to her after I left. I didn't want to know. Not then. I was such a dummy back then. What did I know about how the world worked? I think now she wanted me to kill him. I should have. Instead, I ended up running away. I told myself I wanted to find somewhere out from under the thumb of the NCR and all their rules. But really, I was running from the guilt of not protecting her from Dad. Yeah, it doesn't matter now, though. People always hoping for something better. They usually end up with something worse. Dad was either drunk or not around. I guess he must have run with one of the raider gangs, but I never really knew what he did. Don't know why Mom was with him. Maybe at some point in his life he wasn't a complete asshole. This is also a rare opportunity to hear what was being said about the NCR over the radio on the West Coast decades ago. It was hard to hear because the characters were talking over it, but isolating the radio broadcast, we can listen to the whole thing. And that makes it official, folks. The final vote count from the hub is in. 55% in favor of joining the new California Republic. All five states have now signed on, which means that as of this moment, we are all citizens of the new California Republic. I'm sure that's going to take some getting used to for a lot of people. But here in Shady Sands, people have been waiting for this day for a long time. A crowd has been gathering outside the Hall of Congress all afternoon, and now it looks like quite a party is developing. We're expecting President Aradesh to come out and speak to the crowd any minute now. I think people are hoping the NCR will finally establish peace and prosperity across the whole Southwest. It's quite a historic day. 
Remember, it was only three years ago that President Aradesh first proposed the idea of the Republic. Of course, there are lots of questions to be answered and still a lot of opposition in some quarters. But today is a day to celebrate. The beginning of a new era here in the Southwest. This broadcast is referencing old Fallout lore. After the events of Fallout 1, Shady Sands grew as a settlement until its borders began to bump up against neighboring states. The five states that signed up to become part of the NCR were Shady, which of course was the state formed from Shady Sands, Los Angeles, or the Boneyard, The Hub, Dayglow, and the state of Maxon, the state that formed around the area of Lost Hills, the Brotherhood of Steel's bunker that we got to explore during the events of Fallout 1. The Fallout New Vegas official game guide says that this vote took place in 2189. Assuming that Kellogg is around 10 years old in this scene, that would make him 108 years old to have lived through these events. Could the man that we fought at Fort Hagen have been 108 years old? How is that possible? But we are getting sidetracked. This memory isn't what we are looking for. And so moving down the next connection, we eventually arrive in a ruined kitchen. It's going to be fine. You'll see. But we don't know anybody here. And now with the baby? Come on, Sarah. You've got to give it a chance. I finally got steady work with a good outfit. Nothing like that in the NCR these days. No, I'm not saying this was a mistake. I, I'm just... Are you sure these guys know what they're doing? They seem kind of green. I know. But that's where I come in. Just wait. In a few years, I'll be running my own crew. As soon as I make the connections I need. Then I can give you anything you want. And little Mary, too. I never worried about you before. Must be my mama instincts kicking in. <laughs> Who knew I had those, huh? Come on, you're great with her. And you don't need to worry about me. Most of it's just running security for the she. A lot of standing around looking tough. Well, they sure picked the right person for that job. Listen, it's gonna be great here. See this? This is what's gonna keep you and Mary safe. I promise. I know, Connie. I'm sure we're gonna be really happy here. We are. You'll see. That's okay. I got it. Let's keep looking. I'll connect you to the next intact memory. The thing about happiness is... is you only know you had it when it's gone. I mean, you, you may think to yourself that you're happy, but, uh... You don't really believe it. You focus on that petty bullshit or next job or whatever. It's only looking back by comparison with what comes after that you really understand that's what happiness felt like. I was the worst thing that ever happened to her. If she'd never met me, she'd have stayed in the hub Maybe hooked up with someone who didn't kill people for a living. Probably been happier than she was with me. Almost certainly lived longer. Whatever made me think that a guy like me should have a daughter? No, I, I never deserved her. Not for one second. I thought San Francisco was my chance to start fresh. That was the hot shit. The gunslinger from the hub. Rolling into town with the world at my feet. Everybody knew I was the one who'd shot Valdez. And I could write my own ticket to any outfit in town. It all worked out pretty damn well. For a while. Looking out the window, we see the Golden Gate Bridge, which means this memory took place in San Francisco. And that's why Kellogg was working with the She. The She is a faction that we met during the events of Fallout 2. 
they were the descendants of the survivors of a Chinese submarine that beached in San Francisco shortly after the Great War of 2077. This memory couldn't have taken place during the events of Fallout 2, because if it had, Kellogg would have been 62 in this sequence, but he doesn't look anywhere near 62. This event must have happened long before the Chosen One wandered into San Francisco. But this also is not the memory we are looking for. So moving down the next connection, we arrive in a long hallway. How did you think this was going to end, Kellogg? <laughs> you thought you could just fuck with us and we wouldn't fuck with you? Just so you know, they died like dogs. And you weren't there to help them. I found another memory to try. I'll connect it. Looks like the men he was working with really were green. They picked a fight that was a bit above them. And whomever it was sought vengeance by presumably killing Kellogg's wife and child. But it looks like whomever they were, they didn't last long. Kellogg got his revenge. Moving down the next connection, we arrive in a pub. Mind if we sit down? Suit yourself. So, um, I hear you'll take care of people's problems. Is that right? If you pay me. Oh, we'll pay you. And, uh, you'll do this all by yourself? That's right. We pay you when the job's done. Is that okay? That's the way you want to do it? So who do you want dead? Well, it's like this. There's his family. Lives down the creek a ways. Well, we seem to be getting closer. Try this next one. There's always someone who wanted someone else dead. Sometimes just roughed up, but uh, dead was usually what they wanted. Sometimes they thought they could cheat me. That was usually only when I first arrived somewhere. Didn't matter to me. They just took it as part of the job. A little extra thrown in for free. I always got paid in the end. One way or another. There was always a job for someone like me. Didn't matter what it was. Didn't matter who I was supposed to kill. I got pretty good at it. I don't remember much from that time. It all kind of blends together. It was almost always a bar, though. That's universal. I didn't care where I was going. Ended up mostly wandering east. Getting as far away from San Francisco as I could, maybe. So it was the loss of his family that caused Kellogg to switch from becoming a protector to a gun for hire, an enforcer. With nothing left to lose, I suppose he just didn't care anymore. Heading down the connection, we arrive at the next memory. Mr. Kellogg, I'm glad you decided to meet with me. So, you're with the Institute. I wanted to see for myself if you really existed. We do. As you can see. What do you want? It's come to my attention that you've been rather disruptive of our operations lately. This must stop. I do what people pay me to do. If that's a problem for you, I could see only one way out. And what's that, Mr. Kellogg? If I'm working for you, there's no more problem. From what I hear, you can afford me. I don't think you fully understand the situation you're in. I think I do. Very well. B-748, initiate. Shutting down. Hmm. Impressive. We may have something to talk about after all. Getting warmer. One of these has got to tell us something. We are running out of brain here. Ah. Ah, there's one that looks mostly intact. Connecting now. I finally ended up in the Commonwealth. 
I kind of ran out of road. Plus, I'd come to terms with life. I wasn't going to be stupid enough to get mixed up with caring about other people again. It was just me against the world. And the world had it coming. The first synths weren't all that impressive. I'm good, but I'm not that good. But the Institute could always make more. And kept making them better each time. They still give me the creeps, but... You have to get used to them if you want to work with the Institute. You heard all sorts of rumors about the Institute. But I figured they were just a convenient boogeyman for anything bad that ever happened. They were real, all right. They didn't know anything about operating on the surface. Relied on their synths for everything. They had the resources I needed. And I had the expertise they needed. It turned into a permanent arrangement. Which suited me just fine. At last, he arrives on the East Coast, but it's hard to place this in time. The biggest clue we get is that all of the synths here are Gen 1 synths. We don't see any Gen 2s or Gen 3s. So perhaps this event took place quite a while ago, while he was still, by all appearances, at least middle-aged. Moving down the connection, we arrive someplace familiar. Manual override initiated. Cryogenic stasis suspended. Vault computers are still working. That's good. Checking through the logs. Hopefully it's all- Just find it. Pod C6, down the hall near the end. This is the one. Here. Open it. <laughs> is it over? <laughs> Are we okay? Almost. Everything's gonna be fine. Come here. Come no, here, baby. No, no. I've got him. Let the boy go. I'm only gonna tell you once. I'm not giving you Sean! God damn it. Get the kid out of here and let's go. At least we still have the backup. Cryogenic sequence reinitialized. What's the holdup? I'm almost finished, Kellogg. I just need to confirm. Come on, come on, come on. All right, we're good. I'm, uh, I'm sorry you had to go through that again. I found another intact memory. Whenever you're ready. I was now the Institute's main operator in the Commonwealth. If they needed something done, they came to me. It wasn't usual for anybody from the Institute to come along on a mission, so this one stood out. I didn't know then who it was we were grabbing from the vault. Of course, neither did they. Not really. The eggheads never liked taking orders from a dirty, contaminated degenerate like me. But they needed me, and I made sure they knew it. Even then, I knew it was a mistake leaving him alive. I understood that kind of revenge. No one better. But I was cocky enough to assume I could handle some soft, pre-war vault dweller. Even if he somehow got thawed out. At least I know those Institute bastards will soon get what's coming to them, too. If he could take me out, they won't be able to hide from him for long. I'm glad I didn't have to kill the kid. I'm not saying I haven't done it, but, uh... I never liked to. And yeah, I guess it did remind me of uh, her. Yeah, I'm a cold-hearted bastard for sure, but uh, still human. 
Better this way, though. Better than taking her kid and leaving her alive. I never knew why we didn't just refreeze the rest of them. But we had our orders. <laughs> Guess the old man didn't want so many loose ends. Too bad he left alive the one person he shouldn't have. It was this murder that Kellogg told us was just an unfortunate accident. But this was no accident. He killed Nora because he got frustrated, because he could, because she was a nuisance, and because she was in the way. Moving down the next connection, we arrive in Diamond City. Is that your son? This appears to be a very recent memory. So, good news, I think. Oh boy. Piper has really done it this time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying she's right, but... Mayor, you know, he's gonna be really mad this time. Probably shouldn't have even, uh, uh... Kellogg. It's okay. One of these days, you're gonna get your head blown off just barging in here like that. Minimizing my exposure to civilians is a priority. Forget I said anything. So what's the big crisis this time? New orders for you. One of our scientists has left the Institute. Left? As in? He's gone rogue. Name's Dr. Brian Virgil. We know he's hiding somewhere in the glowing sea. Here's his file. Wow. Some heads are gonna roll for this. Capture and return, or just elimination? Elimination. He was working on a highly classified program. No kidding. One of the top bioscience boys? Damn. So, I guess you're taking the kid back with you. Affirmative. Your only mission is to locate and eliminate Virgil. You're taking me home to my father? Yes. Stand next to me and hold still. Okay. X688. Ready to relay with Sean. Bye, Mr. Kellogg. I hope I see you again soon. Teleportation. Now it all makes sense. Nobody's found the entrance to the Institute because there is no entrance. Let me pull you out of there as soon as you're ready. This whole setup in Diamond City was part of some elaborate plan of the old man's. It seems obvious now that we were bait for our friend from the vault. Timing couldn't have been an accident. It's not how the old man works. I wonder if he outsmarted me in the end. Another loose end tied up. It wasn't my idea to settle down with the kid in the middle of Diamond City. <laughs> I thought it was a terrible idea, actually. But it was one of the old man's pet projects, so here we were. Me and the kid, like a happy little family. I ended up kind of liking it. A reminder of what my life might have been if things had turned out differently. But there's no going back. I knew it was just temporary. It'd be back to normal business before too long. The new breed of synths could easily pass as human. Some of them did. But the coursers, they weren't built to blend in. They were killing machines. Pure and simple. Smarter, stronger, and faster than almost any real human. I'm just glad they were always on my side. Teleportation. That's how you get inside the Institute. Kellogg left Diamond City, not because Nate was on his tail, but because this mission, escorting Sean, was over. He had to track down a rogue scientist named Virgil, and now we understand that entry we read in his terminal. The entry where he talked about hunting a renegade. He wasn't talking about Nate, 
he was talking about Virgil, a renegade former Institute scientist who went rogue. And what did he mean when he said that he was bait for Nate? Bringing Sean here to Diamond City was bait? What, to lure Nate out? But that would mean that the Institute knew about us. They knew we were out of the vault and they wanted to bait us. Why? And we know that this was a very recent memory. Not only did we hear Travis Miles, the DJ on the radio, who's still alive, but he mentioned Piper. Piper has really done it this time. Whom we met when we arrived at Diamond City and who was our friend. And in the broadcast, he was referencing the latest version of Piper's newspaper that had just been published before we arrived at Diamond City, The Synthetic Truth. The one where Piper went on about that story about the broken mask incident. This scene, playing out in this apartment, must have happened mere days before we arrived at Diamond City. And from this memory, we get our first glimpse of what Generation 3 synths really look like. And they are indistinguishable from humans. And it looks like these synths, these agents that the Institute sends out into the Commonwealth, are called coursers, and even Kellogg's afraid of them. And at last we have firm evidence that Sean is alive and he's a 10-year-old boy. They addressed him by his name. He's got the same hair color as Nate. That's gotta be him. Sean was sitting on the ground reading science magazines, which I suppose makes sense if he was raised in the Institute by scientists. What have they taught our boy? Not that science is bad or anything, but if they fostered an interest in science in him, what other interests did they foster in him? I can't show you the song that was playing on the radio due to copyright reasons, but perhaps not coincidentally, it was playing It's All Over But The Crying by The Ink Spots, with lyrics like, I'm trying to forget about how much I care for you. It's all over but the dreaming. Poor little dreams that keep trying to come true. When ready, we can leave Kellogg's memories by looking at the television. Slow movements, okay? I don't know what kind of side effects the procedure might have had. No one's ever done this before. How do you feel? Oh. Am I okay? Are you seeing anything bad? Don't be alarmed. But I honestly don't know what to look for. As I said before, this is uncharted territory. But your neural and physiological readings have returned to normal. From a medical standpoint, you're fine. Next time I have to watch someone's life story, I want popcorn. Well, if you're cognizant enough to joke, I think we can safely say that you're out of critical condition. I have this burning feeling inside my skull. It's like it's on fire. That's not surprising. All the synapses in your brain have just been pulled apart, connected to someone else, and then pulled back together. I injected you with a large stim pack while I was pulling you out. That should ease things. I'm okay, doctor. Thank you. That's good, but I want you to keep monitoring yourself. We have to be sure there's no long-term damage. Are you ready to talk about what happened in there? You were along for the ride, weren't you? You saw what I saw. Yes, but it's important we review everything together, in case either of us missed anything. I saw Kellogg's life. The man who ruined my family. The man I killed. That's right. He was a human being just like the rest of us, and he had reasons for being what he was, however cruel. How does that make you feel? Does it really matter how I feel, Doctor? Yes. You can't tell me that bearing witness to that man's life didn't affect you. I... I'm not sure, Doctor. I don't know if there's any right way to feel, either. It's convinced me that I did the right thing. He was a rabid dog. And he needed to be put down. I suppose I can't fault you for that. It... it wasn't all his fault. I can't blame him for everything that happened. If I were a priest, I would say forgiveness is a good thing. We're getting off track. 
the important thing is that we discovered the Institute's greatest secret, teleportation. The only question is, what do we do now? We got what we needed. The Institute uses teleportation to get in and out. Yes, their greatest secret has finally been revealed. But that only leads to more questions. How does it work? Where do we go next? Don't look at me, Doctor. This stuff is beyond me. Um, let me think. What? You don't have a spare teleporter lying around? What kind of egghead are you? This is serious. No one outside the Institute could dream of making that kind of technology. Wait, maybe that's it. That memory about Virgil, their scientist who went rogue? If we found him... That scientist Kellogg was supposed to track down. Virgil, we need to find him. You're right. A rogue Institute scientist could answer all kinds of questions. There's more than one person who knows about the Institute. W Virgil, th that scientist who escaped. I didn't know Institute scientists could defect. This changes everything. He could answer all sorts of questions. Where did the memory say he was? The glowing sea? That can't be right. No one would risk going there. Not even to hide. What do you think we should do? Um, let me think. What about that memory involving Virgil, the rogue Institute scientist? If he were alive, we have a common enemy. He might help us. There's got to be another way. We delved into every memory we could find. This is the only thing I can think of that might get us more answers. I don't know. I'm not even sure we can track him down. The memory gave us a starting point. The glowing sea. An Institute scientist wouldn't help us. They want him dead, remember? And you kill the man they sent to do it. I think Virgil would have every reason to be grateful. Or at least afraid. His last known location was the glowing sea. Not sure how reliable that memory is. That's not a place people go. Or come back from. I like it. The memory said the Institute tracked him to the glowing sea. But that seems crazy. A madman would think twice about going there. Why? What makes the glowing sea so dangerous? The name says it all. Radiation. So much that nothing there could possibly live. Nothing pleasant. Navigating radioactive hazards is nothing new. But the glowing sea can kill a man in seconds. That's why it doesn't make sense. Virgil fleeing into that hell. The exposure alone. Then he's dead already. It's a waste of time. No. He must have gone there for a reason. He has to be alive. He must have been prepared for it. Look, we don't have any options left. You have to go after him. Through that sea of radioactive ash. That's why he's there. To make the Institute think twice about following him. That must be it. He's using the radiation in the glowing sea like a shield or a cloak. A way to throw them off and be at an advantage. If Virgil found a way to survive there, you'll have to do the same. If you're going to follow him. If we need to find Virgil, then I'm going after him. If you're going to go, be prepared. You'll need some way to combat the radiation there. It's called the Glowing Sea for a reason. How do I fight that much radiation, Doctor? There are chemical compounds. Radex, Radaway. You'd need as much as you could carry. Maybe more. A sealed environment suit would be great if you could find one. Or maybe one of those suits of power armor. That would be perfect. Oh, no. I'm not going there. That's crazy. And plunging into a dead man's memory wasn't crazy? You've already done the impossible. Who's to say God won't let you do it again? Look, think it over if you have to, but it's the only path I can offer. Through the glowing sea to Virgil. Oh, I'm going in naked. Fingers crossed I get superpowers. I know you're joking, but as a doctor, I feel obligated to remind you that unprotected radioactive exposure will only kill you. Dead. D-E-A-D. -E so be sure you find a way to get through there with your life intact. And good luck. I'll find a way to get through the rads. Don't worry. Good luck. And be safe. By the way, I unplugged Mr. Valentine first. Removed the implant while you were waking up. He's waiting for you upstairs. With that, we begin the quest, The Glowing Sea. Find Virgil in the glowing sea. Thankfully, on a table right next to her, we find three pieces of Radway and two vials of Radex, as well as some dirty water and stim packs. There's more Radway in a toolbox underneath the table. This is great, but it's not nearly enough. 
We're gonna need something much more substantial if everything Amari said about the glowing sea is true. Nearby, we find a desk with a copy of Robco Fun. Perfect. We have collected an issue of Robco Fun. Includes the Grognak the Barbarian holotape game. We can now play Grognak in the Ruby Ruins from our Pip-Boy. On this table, we find some buff out and dirty water. Then on a rear table, we find some purified water and scrap. With a chem cooler on a nearby cabinet filled with medics. After looting a first aid kit by the door with even more rat away and purified water inside, we can head through the door and back up into the memory den to try to find Nick Valentine. We could explore the memory den here, but I've actually covered the entire place as well as the quests that go on here in previous episodes. Much of the stuff inside is set to owned anyway, so we can't take it without stealing. There is a terminal upstairs, but it deals with good neighbor lore, some of the characters we find around here, and some of their quests, which I already covered in my series on good neighbor. So heading downstairs, we can try to find Nick Valentine, but on our way out, we see a familiar face in a memory lounger. This guy, again? We can't talk to him. He's browsing some memory at the moment. I guess we'll leave him be. In an adjacent room, we find Kent Connolly manning a radio. Kent Connolly starts the Silver Shroud quest, which I also covered in a dedicated video. We find Nick Valentine sitting on a couch right next to the exit. Nick. Hope you got what you were looking for inside my head. <laughs> that was right. I should have killed you when you were on ice. What did you say? You want to try for round two? Let's go. Nick. Are you still in there? Kellogg? Is that you? What? What are you talking about? You feeling all right, Nick? Yeah, I'm fine. Why? Nothing. Never mind. If you say so. You sounded like Kellogg just then. Did I? Huh. Mari said there might be some mnemonic impressions left over. Wait. Were you just playing a joke on me? I guess that's for you to wonder and for me and Kellogg's memories to know for sure. Anyway, I feel fine, so let's get going. Or I could head back to Diamond City, since you've got company already. We have to head into the Glowing Sea. Any advice? Hmm. I'm a synth, so radiation isn't much of an issue for me, but an old suit of power armor might just be the guardian angel you're looking for. That, or you could buy up all the rad X and rad away you can find from any chem dealer who's got it in stock. There's something wrong with you, Nick. I don't want you with me. I told you I'm fine. But I get it. Going through Kellogg's brain was a doozy for both of us. I'll be in Diamond City when you've had time to cool off. Let's get going, Nick. Been one heck of a ride so far. Let's see where it takes us next. I'll see you around, Nick. Good luck out there. You know where to find me. Pneumotic impression? That seemed more than just an impression. That wasn't just Kellogg's voice. That was something Kellogg would say if he were still alive. Is he still alive? Could he be part of Nick now? Oh. At any rate, no matter which companion we choose to take with us, we now know what we've got to do. We've got to find a rogue institute scientist named Virgil who's hiding in the glowing sea. The most inhospitable place in all of the Commonwealth. Great. In our next episode, we'll find something to hold the rads at bay, either a suit of power armor or a radiation suit if we can get our hands on one, and wade into the glowing sea. I publish new Fallout episodes every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop, at last, Stinkin' Wolves! That's right, if you're a regular viewer of my live streams, you'll know that I'm plagued by wolves in every game I chance to play. They always seem to catch me by surprise. This shirt is an homage to all the times I've died to wolves in the various games I've played. And you can get this design on a bunch of different shirt styles for men, women, and children and in a variety of colors. You can find it on other products too. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here.
If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos and access to ox emojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with the next episode in the full story of Fallout 4.